G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. It's Jesse here and in today's video, I'm going to be taking you through my final preseason ladder prediction. Now I did one a few months ago, which you know doesn't really count, it was just kind of to fill the void. Um, and then we've done a predictions podcast in which we do a really lengthy analysis. But today is going to be my short, condensed version of all that. I'm going to give you my final prediction from the bottom of the ladder to the top. Now, as I said, it's going to be pretty short and sharp moving through the team pretty quickly. If you want some more detailed content, go check out that podcast, True Footy Podcast 48. Bush and I literally go through all the teams and we discuss where we think they're at. So I am going to get straight into it today, guys. Let's start at the bottom of the ladder and 18th spot. I am predicting the Gold Coast Suns take out second spoon in a row. Now, to be honest with you, I've got a bit of a gut feel about Gold Coast that they're probably actually going to avoid the spoon this year. But if I'm looking at it logically on paper, it's hard to justify any team below them. So frankly, I just think with the talent that they've got, they're in a better position than in previous years. But it's going to be a similar story where they might start the season well, jag a few wins, but I think with all the youth on their list and lack of experienced players, it's going to be a similar story of not being able to play a full season uh, at the same level throughout the year. I know they've added experienced players, but I just don't think it's going to cut it for a full season. In 17th spot, and this was even harder than picking the Wooden Spooner, I've actually gone the Adelaide Crows this time, and my logic for that is uh, they their top-end talent I just don't think is extremely strong. It's solid. They've still got some decent plays in there. They've cleared away heaps of their second tier to other clubs and they cleared out their dead wood. Clearly preparing for a rebuild. They've put in a lot of youth into the list uh, and as a result, I think they're going to try and sort of pump games into the youth, experiment with a few new things. Got a new coach, so there's less pressure to perform. Frankly, I don't know if I, I don't see them necessarily as the second worst list, but you know, they've looked a little lackluster this preseason. It's between them and Sydney, but frankly, I just have Adelaide finishing second last. And that leads me to 16th spot and the club that I just touched on, the Sydney Swans. And this is a team I ummed and ahed about this whole off-season. I originally put them in the bottom two, and then I amended that thinking they're actually going to push higher up the ladder. But to be honest, if I'm just looking at their list, they've got extremely good top-end talent. You start with Buddy Franklin, probably a top five or six player in the competition. And then you guys got, got guys like Heaney, Parker, Josh Kennedy, Rampy, and there's pretty good top-end talent. But then after that, the reliance is pretty strong on some quite young players. And while I do think they have some of the best youth in the comp, I just don't think it'll translate in enough wins to avoid the bottom four for a second year in a row. So I'm going to cop the heat, but I'm going to I'm going to back in my original call. Sydney finished third last. To round out the bottom four, I've got Carlton. And I know this one will be unpopular as well. But frankly, I agree with, I think it was Lee Matthews who said he thinks they're closer to the bottom four than the top eight. And I I think it was Lee Matthews. I can't be bothered checking on my phone, but correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But essentially, I just think there's, again, similar to Sydney, there's good youth on the list, but I don't think they're quite at that age where they're going to take the next step. And they're going to start the year without Kerno and Mackay, and eventually they'll get those players back. But I think there's, that's an important avenue to goal that they've lost. Frankly, I just don't see it. I'm going to say they still make the bottom four. In 14th spot, I am going with Fremantle. And this is a team that I usually try and make a case for finishing higher because I think they're underrated in terms of what they can produce when they've got a fully fit available list. But the downside this year is that they don't really have a very available list. Some important players are missing. They've got Fife and Walters, but in the absence of Pierce and Hamling and Nathan Wilson, Jesse Hogan's unavailable. Ed Langdon, Brad Hill have left the club. Blake Akers, their replacement, sort of is injured as well. Frankly, I just think they're going to actually struggle. And similar to Adelaide, they've got a new coach, maybe under a little less pressure. Adapting to a new game style, they're going to drop a lot of games. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, I just think they're going to finish fifth last. Next up, I've got St. Kilda, who I really wanted to put higher in this ladder prediction. But frankly, I'd be disingenuous because I just don't really rate their best 22 quite enough. Now, they, there is a lot of cases to be made for them moving up the ladder, but I've touched on before. They've got a better injury list than last year. In fact, it's a perfect injury list at the moment. Last year, they obviously had one of the worst in the league. Uh, and the fact that they've added to their list, and um, even though they lost a few players, they brought more in. There was a net positive there. Um, I just don't think their best 22 can compete 
quite on the same level as those teams really gunning for those top six to eight positions. So I've got them in 13th, but I kind of rate them evenly with pretty much all the teams up until about 9th or 10th. Um, but for now, I've just slotted them into 13th spot and I'll be watching closely how their season unfolds. Another team that I've got in that sort of mid glut of the ladder is North Melbourne, who I've got in 12th spot. Now, North are a team that I couldn't really make a strong case for moving up or moving down the ladder. I do rate their youth. Um, they've also got some very good experienced players, but I think they kind of still own that glut where they, they rely on their experienced players a little bit too much and the young players need to come through and shoulder more of the load. You've got Ben Brown in there already playing to an elite standard. Robbie Tarrant in the midfield in particular, they rely heavily on Cunnington and Higgins. And now it's time for guys like LDU, Bonar, Simpkin, and the, and the rest to really stand up and shoulder some more responsibility. So as a result, I can't actually see them moving up the ladder too far. I've got them more or less finishing where they did last year in 12th spot. In 11th spot, I've got Porter Adelaide and they're an enigmatic team. I think this will spell the end for Ken Hinckley as coach. It might not even last a full season if they have a bad start to the year. But while I do sort of rate their, their mature plays, they're nothing really special to write home about. Sorry, Anthony. Um, but their youth is really exciting. Obviously, Connor Rosie is one of the one of the best elite talents going in the competition under that sort of under 21 range. So they've got a lot to look forward to. I think they'll probably have to push some games into those younger guys. And as a result, I expect them to be inconsistent. And they're kind of already the embodiment of inconsistency already. So I've got them finishing in 11th spot. Next up is the hardest team in the league to place this season. I've got Melbourne finishing 10th on the basis that I don't think they'll quite return to their, their standards of two years ago where they made the prelim and looked like a dark horse to win the whole thing late in that final series. Uh, but obviously, they clearly I clearly don't believe that they're going to finish in the bottom two again. Um, what I think will happen is that they'll start to regain their confidence over the course of the season. They're going to be inconsistent. A lot of their youth, sorry, a lot of their improvement will be driven from young guys starting to hit their prime like Petrarca and Brayshaw, Clayton, Oliver. Long story short, I think Melbourne are going to be all over the place this season and it won't be enough to jag a final spot. I've got them finishing 10th. In 9th spot, I've got Essendon narrowly missing the finals, which will be a cruel blow to their fans. Now, they have looked promising in the Marsh series, but I'm trying not to take too much away from that. I've talked in the past how they look very... Injury structures, they're undoubtedly injury struck at the moment with some key players missing and not getting a proper preseason, which may affect them down the road. And while we know on their day they are a very good team, I think over the course of the season, for a start, they're an inconsistent team, but if they've got key players without a preseason, um, I think there's a case to be made that they might just not quite hit the same heights as last year. I mean, last year was an inconsistent year from them to begin with. Some of the performances they put in the latter half of the year were terrible. Um, Essendon, I'm still going to be seeking that consistency this year, and that's why I've got them just missing the finals. In eighth spot, I've got the Hawks returning to a top eight spot with some key ins in uh, Sam Frost and John Patton, helping them structurally. I know they're not necessarily amazing players, but that will help. And I think some, obviously, Tom Mitchell coming back to the side, their full midfield complement with James Warple now a far better player than he was when he last played with Mitchell. Scully's in there, Wingard in there. The mix there is quite dangerous. They've got a very proficient forward line with Gunston and Bruce amongst others. I think their best 22 is strong. I'm yet to be convinced about the depth of their maybe 22 to 30 range, and that's why I don't have them higher. But I think Hawthorne is certainly good enough to play finals again this season. In seventh spot, I've got the Geelong Cats sliding from first to seventh, and then they're a popular one. And because they're a popular one pick to slide, that's why I feel a bit dirty to sort of just hopping on the bandwagon. But the case to be made for them dropping down a little bit is strong. Uh, Tim Kelly leaving is probably the biggest factor in all that. Um, and they've, they've got a big push on youth. Last year, they took many draft picks. I think they took six in the first 45. When a team's doing that, it usually indicates that they want to sort of give games to the youth as well. Now, I certainly don't think that Geelong are going to start rebuilding and playing the kids every week, but it suddenly means you replace a Tim Kelly with someone like a Cooper Stevens. And I just don't think Geelong, with all the other aging players, will be quite up to their standards of last year. So I think they'll still be, they'll still beat a few good teams this year but not really be in the running for the premiership race, in my opinion. Next, I have the other half of last year's top two, the Brisbane Lions. Now, again, I don't really have a strong case to be made for them sliding down the ladder too far. In fact, they're only sliding four spots from second to six. Essentially, I just think with a little bit more opposition analysis on them now, everyone's sort of worked them out a little bit, or at least they've had the chance to. They're gonna have a harder fix to this season. 
at the moment they're very fit and healthy which is a great start so if that stays the case stays the case they can probably win enough games to jag a top four spot but frankly I just if I'm honest I don't have them on the same level as the team teams above them I thought they were made some very shrewd moves in the offseason to consolidate their depth and there's a lot of young talent on that list who are only gonna get better so I expect them to be a play a similar sort of standard as last year but I just don't have them quite as good as the other teams we're about to go through. In fifth spot, I have got Collingwood, and for where Collingwood have been in the last couple of seasons, finishing fifth would probably be considered a bit of a failure because they've been right in the thick of that premiership sort of race. Now, obviously, they lost the grand final in 2018, and last year would have been just as devastating, losing to the Giants in the prelim, which really was a game they shouldn't have ever lost, particularly when you look at the sort of GWS performance we saw the following week. I thought they could have given Richmond a, a real run for, the, for their money in the grand final last year. Um, so for them, that will be a very painful memory now. Could go both ways. They could sort of uh, use that as fuel or it might be quite um, sort of debilitating a little bit um, to think back on two years where they got so close to making it all the way. Look, there's not too much to report on in terms of changes at Collingwood. They've had a couple of quiet off seasons in a row. Their big recruit from a couple of years ago, Dane Beans, may not play football again. So you, you just have to take them on face value. They're a great side. I just think they're going to slide out of the top four and be leapfrogged by the team I'm about to mention. In fourth spot, I have got everyone's favorite dark horse this year, the Western Bulldogs. They're a tricky one for me because they're another side that has been horribly inconsistent. Even in the year they won the flag, obviously they finished seventh and never really looked like the team to beat. But I just think the where their list is at in terms of the age profile, guys like Bont, Dunkley, McRae and Hunter, they're all actually reaching their prime now, similar to sort of what's happening at GWS. And as a result, I think this year, um, is the year they've finally actually assert themselves as a top four team. In fact, they haven't finished, a, I don't think they've finished top four with this group. Uh, in obviously, the premiership year, they finished seventh, and then I think they finished fifth a few years before that. So that would actually be a big achievement for them. I think they'll leapfrog Collingwood, and they'll be super hungry this season. In third spot, I've got the West Coast Eagles, and obviously being a fan, it's very hard to be completely impartial with this. I've had them top two previously. I'm now thinking, realistically, I rate them slightly behind the other two teams, which I'll get to. But the list is very strong. They're strong across all lines. Josh Kennedy's probably going to... I, I think he's going to improve big on last year where I, he, well, he hasn't really been fit for three years and it, I think it took his toll on him. But you've seen in the marsh, he's moving freely again. And I, I actually think he's such a key part of the Eagles resurgence, more important than probably the recruitment of Tim Kelly, to be honest. Like any other team, they're gonna rely on a bit of luck, how the other top four teams fare. With 15 and seven last year, got them fifth, but in previous years, it's gotten teams like the minor premiership. So we'll just have to wait and see on the Eagles. I think they're as good as just about anyone, but um, obviously a couple of instances last year where they dropped their bundle a little bit and let opportunities slip. In second spot, I've got the Richmond Tigers. And uh, there's not really too much I need to really say about this side. Obviously, Alex Rance has retired, but that didn't really affect them or it won't affect them as much because, you know, D Dylan Grimes was amazing last year. I guess what you could say then is if Grimes goes down now, they're screwed. Now, they have lost a couple of depth players, two or three depth players, but overall, I don't think it's going to affect them too much. Last year, they copped probably the worst injury run they have in a number of years, and they still won the bloody flag and played amazing football. I still think they're the team to beat, but I don't have them finishing first. I actually think the GWS Giants are going to take home the minor premiership this year. Now, GWS are obviously probably the most talented list in the competition, but what they've lacked is that real killer edge, I think, that teams like Richmond and West Coast in previous years have had. It was only until the finals last year, particularly against Brisbane, I guess against the Bulldogs in week one and then against Collingwood where we saw GWS play like an actual champion team to that point. They just had a lot of promise. Can they take that into next year? That's going to be critical. I think they, I probably will back them in to do it. Um, obviously, the counter argument is most teams who get belted in a grand final don't back it up with a good season the following year. But nonetheless, I'm going with my head here. GWS will win the minor premiership, but I don't think they're going to win the grand final. I'm going to say Richmond face off with West Coast in the grand final of the MCG. I think this is probably the... Well, this is the grand final I want to see, but I'm obviously an Eagles fan. But I think this, as an if in was neutral, I think these two have sort of the next burgeoning rivalry. I don't know. Maybe that's just a very WA opinion. I'm going to say Richmond take home the premiership again, beating my beloved Eagles in the grand final. I hope that doesn't happen, but that, I will make that my prediction. The Brownlow medal, I'm going to say Bontempelli wins his first medal. I think he's prime. I think he's ready. I would say Nat Fife, but I don't think I have the confidence in betting on him playing a full season again. 
Common Metal's tough. I think it's out of a few people. I think I said Ben Brown in the video the other day, so I'll just go with that. Obviously, that depends on North and how well they play this season, but I think it's just a matter of time before he wins one. The Rising Star, honestly, I think it's probably going to be Matt Rao, but I am going to go a little bit different. Don't want to pick the boring option. I'm going to back in my boy Dylan Stevens to take that home. But anyway, guys, thank you for watching this video. Let me know in the comments what you thought of my predictions. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe. Otherwise, I will see you guys all in the next video. Cheers.